and briefly reiterate that for those of us that are not here. You can absolutely label all of it yourself. That is totally awesome. If you want to label all of it, um, some of these muscles, um, they seem like they're parts of other smaller muscles. They look very similar. Part of the problem or part of the bummer of not being able to do the dissection is that you don't get to see where these muscles overlap as much um, or where one muscle ends and one muscle begins. And those, those little subtleties um, you guys are missing out on, which is a super bummer. So let me reiterate real quick what I've been, what I've been talking about before we started recording. I have updated the assignments for labs 17 through 19. They are going to be based on the human body coloring book only. So the lab manual, um, the old lab, ye old lab manual that we've been looking at all this time, we're basically abandoning for the rest of the semester because it's not useful to us since we're not doing an actual dissection of a rabbit or a cat. Um, and we're not using the models that are described in the eye and ear lab. So instead, if you go to your canvas and you go to assignments and you find the next three labs, they are labs 17, 18, and 19, same as the syllabus has always said, um, but instead of being the superficial muscles of the rabbit, the deep muscles of the rabbit, and the arm and leg muscles of the rabbit, they are going to be associated with the head and neck muscles, the torso muscles for 18, and the arm and leg muscles for lab 19. And if you go into each assignment, you will see that the pages are there for you to download. So these are the scanned images of the pages from the human body coloring book that are assigned for each lab. So if you didn't purchase this book, you have them here for you. These are what I would like you to um, complete and upload. And again, if you would like to complete um, the entire lab in terms of labeling everything, you're welcome to do that. However, I do have many of these muscles crossed out on the actual pages that I have uploaded here, um, which if you are using copy that you purchased, you'll want to reference this to cross out the ones that we're not using. Um, and these crossed out muscles are uh, not required and will not be on the exam. Uh, but feel free to put them on your um, completed uh, uploads, your completed copies of this. That's perfectly awesome if you would like to do that, but it is not required. What is required is the stuff that is not crossed out, which corresponds to the stuff that um, Professor Campo um, is using uh, in her class and has used in her class uh, in previous semesters. Okay, so those are all there in Canvas under the assignments. Um, I have also finished your guys' study guide for your exam, which I realized is Thursday, hello. So um, I have that here at the end of our, we're on like week 13, you guys. We're in the home stretch, this is it. We need to like, you guys are gonna be pushing to the finish, right? We are pushing to the finish here. We are almost done. Once we finish with muscles, we are going on to eye and ear and then that's it. We have our final on eye and ear only um, and then, we made it. We actually freaking made it, right? So we're here in week 12, right? This was our stuff on Tuesday we talked about, sarcomeres and all the crazy Z-disc and A-band and I-band, all that gnarly cross-bridge cycle stuff. Uh, here's our lecture from that day. This is where we are today. Here's the PowerPoint I'm going to be talking about today. And down here at the bottom, is your study guide for exam four. It is short. If you take a look at it, I will up open it here. And if you take a look at it, it's pretty short. The muscle tissue stuff is a little bit longer than the actual muscular system part. But to be fair, these last three are like, identify all the major muscles of this region. Um, so it's still short compared to all the rest of our exams. They are, it's only two chapters involved here. Again, we're still having a lecture exam and a lab exam. Lecture exam will be multiple choice, true, false, multiple answer questions, uh, pulled from the Wiley Plus test bank. And the lab exam will be uh, images 
um, with an arrow pointing at a thing, at a muscle saying, or a structure in microscopic muscle saying, what is this? Um, so same kind of deal. Um, I am tempted, I don't know if I should even say this out loud at this point, but because it seems like it's coming up really, really fast, and I know that you guys are probably freaked out about that, I'm, I'm seriously considering uh, having the exam start on Friday um, instead of Thursday, and actually using Thursday for an office hours um, for a QA. and a um, If that's something that you would like to do, let's try out our poll feature <laughs> and see how you guys feel. I'm pretty sure this is a complete waste of time. I'm sure, I think I know what you guys <laughs> want from this uh, to Friday the 15th. Single choice, yes or no. Uh, and uh, shall we just, can we just go? Let's just go. It can be anonymous here. We don't, we don't need to know. Not that everybody will probably won't have the exact same answer. Okay. You guys see this? Do you guys have access to this? Mm, I don't know where we would. Is there a poll option on your Zoom? In your Zoom menu? No. No poll? No. Okay, well then I'll just send an email. I'll send an email tonight and we will discover how you guys, okay. I'm assuming that that sounds like a good plan. Yeah? I'm, all, I'm for Thursday. I really don't care. If you're, you're like ready for it to be done. I figure it'll either be everybody's like, ah, give us more time for muscles or everybody's like totally degaff over the semester, wants it to be over. We'll just do it. <laughs> I mean, I'm up for like, because either way, it's Thursday through Sunday, right? It'll be Friday through Monday if I postpone it. So you'll still have the same amount of time. I'm just going to push it back a day so that we can instead use Thursday for a, a Q&A. So I'm an essential person right now. Yeah, so you won't be a person. It's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm essential too, so it's kind of hard. I'm a person right now. I have, to, I have to be at work on Monday. The other option is to push it back like a full like class period or push us all, push everything back a class period because we have at the end of the semester a full week that I'm using for catch up and review before the final exam. Um, so basically we'll either, we can either finish the semester early um, and then take a random final early June. Um, you, said, you said finish early this semester? The semester will we will finish the semester early compared to other classes, I think, because we're gonna have our exam our last midterm will be done next week. And then we're just gonna have two more lectures after that, which means that we have two whole weeks. We have yeah, two whole weeks of just review before the final. DJ, I love how you moved your hoodie to like make sure you heard that right. <laughs> Did I get that? <laughs> Did I hear you? I mean, I'm ready to be done and party for a whole week at my house. <laughs> Yeah, I got nowhere to go. I feel you. I'm kind of on. I'm kind of on the same page, but you know, I'm the instructor. Of course, I just want it to be done and over with. If you guys would like more time before your exam four, um, then you will have the chance to let me know that in a poll that I will send to you over email. Poll, exam four. Uh, hey, you still want that e-text just for fun and giggles? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll send it from my personal email. Because that counts for part A and part B too, right? So it'll be useful. Yeah, it's like a thousand something pages. I'm sure it is. I'm so sorry. If it doesn't send, oh well. Um, we might, we can figure something else out. Maybe like a Dropbox link or something. Okay. We'll figure it out. Okay. So that was it that I had for announcements. Um, any questions before I get started on today's lecture where we're going to start on all of these muscles that we need to talk about. I'm so hurt. <laughs> from, from Tuesday? Oh, from the last exam? Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't attending Tuesday because I was so salty. Oh, I, oh my god, DJ. for hours. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I kind of had that feel. I kind of got that vibe. I was like, oh, DJ's mad at me. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what's happening. I, 
I felt like it was just, it was crazy. It was gnarly, but you still did really good. You still did really good. Everybody actually did like, did like surprisingly well on that stupid, stupid exam. So um, is that something we're going to do? Like, is it going to be like that again, this um, upcoming test? The muscles, the lecture part, I'll, I'm going to pull at least some of them. I'm going to pull from the test bank. I'm going to go through it like five times instead of three times this time to make sure that there aren't any of those like write in describe questions or weird questions. Yeah, that takes too much time for like our... If you, if you get one of those, don't even bother with it because I'm going to give you full credit for it anyway. Because it's not part, it wasn't part of the deal. I told you guys it would be multiple <laughs> choice, true, false. I know I was a little um, ashamed of myself. I had to open my book and I did not want to because I was like freaking out. Like, what was this? I it was on the slides. I don't blame you. I swear I went through the test bank and I scrolled like all the way down. It was like more questions. Okay. And just deleted everything that was weird. And got to the end of it and thought I had them all, but I guess I didn't. So not I'm, yeah. just, I'm making excuses for myself. It's it's BS. I'm still open to your guys' complaints. If you want to email me about a specific question that you hated, I'm still open to like revisiting your exam. So shoot me. Yeah, I felt like I don't know. I feel like even when I did the exam, I knew because I did study, I studied a lot. And when I when I took the test, I was like even hesitant. I was like, what is this? There's a lot of, I don't know if you could check, double check my exam, but I will. There was a lot of things that I felt like was not even like covered or even in like, I know that Wiley's like all focused in the book. Yeah. But then it's like, all, you know, in the text. It's just, it's just way too much. Yeah, if you felt like it was really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, but I'll go through it. I'll double check it for stuff that I, that I think was fair or unfair. Um, but if you have specific ones in mind, then let I'm me all and I'll look at them. Yeah. The whole test. I'm just kidding. The whole test. Yeah. So the way that I write questions, and again, I've said this before, I don't, it's hard to tell, especially when you're like a starting out instructor, whether or not the questions that you are writing from the top of your head are too easy or too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to like at least supplement with the test bank questions to get some, because you're supposed to have like, you know, like Question, like easy questions, medium questions, and hard questions. Mm -hmm. so that you get a good mix for everybody in terms of like who studied really hard, mm -hmm. who got the hard questions, and who didn't study that much but still got the easy questions. There's a whole science to the damn thing. I'm not very good at it yet. Um, so I wanted to kind of supplement that to see if I could get a better mix because it seemed like you guys were averaging like high 80s low 90s on all of the exams which made me feel like my questions were too easy so um i think maybe you guys were just like working your butts off but um and i still feel like you guys have been working your butts off and it showed in your exams so um stressful yeah i'm sorry that i stressed you out i'm really sorry that i stressed you out i'll take i literally i for some odd I, i'm wondering if there's a way that i could literally print out my exam just for future like for my own knowledge because i want to be like you know to even study up on that like yeah. can you can you not is there no way i don't i don't think so i think only for the lab we can open it but i don't think for the lecture one we can the lecture one didn't open let me take, a, I'll take another look at that. I, and I, I think able to, for my own knowledge, just to, you know, see kind of where I'm at even. Let's see. And, and all, um, your PowerPoint is locked. I can't open it either. What? Which one for today? 10. I think I tried to do 10 today and it wasn't letting me. It says something about canvas. Can't open it through canvas. Well, that's just silly. Let's see. Did I not publish it for some reason? Oh, it's there. Try it again. I don't know why it would. I don't know why it would be like that. From yeah, back, back in ten. Um, um, Jessica it's said, "Is a PowerPoint there. locked? I can't download it." I think she's talking about eleven as well. Yeah, eleven. I can't think of what it would, why it would be locked. I did, I did re-upload it a couple of times. Um, I've been trying to deal with this whole, um, the accessibility. Yeah, see? It says this um, resource does not exist. Is that as of right this minute? Yeah, I just clicked on it. I don't know if you could see it. 
Resource does not exist. Ah, uh, I don't know, man. It's here on mine. That's really weird. Let me send you guys, I'll send you guys all an email with it. Um, just in case, because that's really annoying. Yeah, I don't, um, it's not loading on my end either. Okay. And really check in yours to see if it pops up. Who, me? Christina? Me? Yeah, one of you guys, just see if it's, because it's, it's. Well, I already asked it let me, I even printed mine out, it let me. Oh, okay. Did you say 11? Yeah. Chapter 11. No one lets me. Okay. Yeah, no, it gives it to me too. I'm sending it via email just in case. So you have it, should have it in your email now. I don't know why it wouldn't show up on um, directly from Canvas. That's really annoying. Um, I'll dig in a little bit to that, but I don't know why. I got it through the email. It's fine. I got it through the email now. Okay. That's just, it's just spooky. I just don't like, I don't like having to rely on technology that's not dependable. That's really irritating. Okay. So here it is. If you can't get through it through, through Canvas for whatever reason, I just mailed it to you. What we're going to be talking about today is I'm going to be, um, sweeping up a little bit from chapter 10 and kind of sweeping it into chapter 11. I think it kind of flows well. So um, you're, it's, it's reflected correctly in terms of the chapter that the information is from on your study guide. Um, basically, these first two slides <laughs> um, are going, or maybe three, the first three slides are stuff that's technically from chapter 10. Okay, so. Um, because this PowerPoint is very, very short, and um, the PowerPoint itself, not the lecture. The PowerPoint is short. So let's get started since the lecture is not very short. Let's see, let me make sure that I'm not missing anybody. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's published, so I don't know what the deal is, but I'll look at it after the, after the fact. In the meantime, it's in the email. And uh, so let me start out with, um, so, Let's recap super briefly on microscopic stuff of the muscle, right? So we talked about muscles, fascicles, muscle fiber, which is a muscle cell. And inside of every muscle cell are all the little myofibrils, right? Which are those little rod-like elements that pack that muscle cell um, and make, take up most of the space in that muscle cell. Each myofibril has sarcomeres all the way down its length. And the sarcomeres are those weird liney structures with the A band and the I band and the Z disc and the M line and the H zone, right? You kind of know all of them. All of those guys are in each sarcomere, which are on myofibrils, right? And those are the smallest uh, contractile units of muscle, right? So we talked about the cross bridge cycle and the overlapping of the thick and thin filaments in each sarcomere cause the sarcomere to get smaller, therefore the myofibril gets smaller, therefore the muscle fiber gets smaller, therefore the fascicle gets smaller, and therefore your whole muscle gets smaller, right? It's muscle contraction. So when we were looking at that first slide from the last, um, from the last PowerPoint, I might actually just, just whip that out real quick here. Okay, so I showed you this, right? Um, when we talk about a motor unit, which is my first term here, a motor unit, and it includes the motor neuron and all of the skeletal muscle fibers that it stimulates, okay? So you might consider this image here from the chapter 10 PowerPoint to be a motor unit, okay? It includes the motor neuron, which is basically the one, the single nerve cell um, from the very end of that one branch of that nerve that feeds that muscle, right? So we talked about how each muscle is served by a single nerve and a single vein and a single artery, which branches off and each branch terminates in a single neuron. The nerve gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to one neuron, right? Because nerves are just bundles of neurons. You get to that last one neuron and that axon 
leads to multiple axon terminals and each terminal interacts with a muscle fiber or muscle cell. And all of those muscle fibers and the myofibrils inside of them and that single motor neuron is considered a motor unit, okay? So the motor unit is the motor, that last motor neuron plus all the skeletal muscle fibers that it stimulates. Motor units are recruited based on how many you need for the task at hand, right? So you've got um, literally millions of these, um, many, many in each one of your muscles, right? And your muscles don't just, uh, they do contract as a unit, right? But not all of the, um, not all of the muscle fibers are um, exerting the same amount of force all the time, right? That's why we have such nice subtle control over our muscle movements. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna bend my arm and you do that every time, right? You can like have fine control over how much you bend your arm. And that's because if you're going to pick up something really, really heavy, then you're gonna recruit more of these motor units than if you're picking up something very, very light or if you're um, doing some other very slight movement, right? If you're just doing a very slight movement, then you probably are going to recruit fewer motor units than if you are trying to pick up something really, really heavy and you need all of the motor units for that muscle, okay? So that's part of why we have such nice, fine motor control over our muscles most of the time is because we are able to um, recruit different numbers of motor units depending on what you're trying to do with your muscles. You have different types of muscle fibers in your muscles, right? Which means that your motor units are going to be stimulating um, these two different types of muscle fibers. Your book actually describes three, but I'm only going to um, ask you to know the two major ones, which are going to be the slow twitch fibers and the fast twitch fibers. So your slow twitch fibers are also known as slow oxidative fibers um, because they use, they use oxygen from aerobic respiration, okay? These fibers, these muscle cells, have lots and lots of mitochondria um, because that's where aerobic uh, respiration happens, cellular respiration happens um, in those cells, right? So they have lots and lots of mitochondria. And because of that, and because of all like the blood vessels needed to bring oxygen, um, to those fibers, the slow, the muscle tissue that is made up of slow twitch fibers is actually dark red looking, okay? This is the dark meat of the chicken, okay? And of you, all right? So just like chickens have dark meat and white meat, so do we. The dark meat is made up of slow twitch fibers, which have lots of mitochondria and lots of capillaries to feed oxygen for aerobic or cellular respiration, okay? The slow twitch fibers, the difference between slow and fast twitch in terms of what they do and what they're used for, is that the slow twitch fibers, they're weaker, they're not as strong, and they're slower, but they are very resistant to fatigue. So you can use them for a lot longer, okay? So as long as your heart is pumping oxygen to these slow twitch fibers, they will continue to use that oxygen uh, to produce ATP to keep on going. So basically, the slow twitch fibers are the ones that you're going to use if you're running a marathon, right? If you're pacing yourself, going for a very, very long time, but not exerting like a ton of energy all at once. That's in contrast to your fast twitch fibers. These are your white meat. They're literally white. They have fewer blood vessels going to them and fewer um, mitochondria. Because instead of using the ATP directly from oxygen, the way that slow twitch fibers do, your fast twitch fibers are actually using glycogen. So they're called fast glycolytic fibers, um, in addition to fast twitch fibers, because they use glycogen, which is the stored sugar, right, that your muscles store a certain amount of all the time to move, to work. So since you only have a certain amount of glycogen in your muscle at any given time and it needs to be like refreshed after you've used it all, your fast twitch fibers fatigue very, very quickly. They use up that glycogen and then they're done. But when they're using that glycogen, they are super strong and super fast. These are your muscle fibers that you're gonna use in a sprint, okay? These are your sprinting muscle fibers, the fast twitch fibers. 
So slow twitch fibers, or think of those as kind of like you're running a long marathon and you're pacing yourself. They're not very, they're not particularly strong or fast, but they go and go and go and go. They have, they have a long um, life uh, before they get tired out. And your fast twitch fibers are if you're gonna be running a sprint um, and you only need, you need to be very, very strong and fast for a hundred meters, right? Um, and then you fatigue, then they're done. They use up all the glycogen in their cells and they're done, okay? So motor units can contain different combinations of slow and fast twitch fibers. Um, but they usually contain one or more, one more of one than the other, right? So when you're recruiting your motor units, you're either usually recruiting more of the slow twitch versus the fast twitch fibers if you're doing something that um, requires less immediate strength and you're doing it for a very long time. And you'll go be recruiting motor units with more fast twitch fibers if you're like jumping up and running 100 meters really fast or have to be really, really strong for a minute. You're lifting a car off a baby or something, right? <laughs> so that leads me to another element of how we are able to control um, our muscles. So not only do you recruit different numbers of motor units and different types of muscle fibers in terms of fast twitch versus slow twitch, you also have control over um, the actual sarcomeres and how hard they work, okay? So you have what is called isotonic contraction when the tension remains constant while the muscle changes in length. So isotonic contraction would be when you are lifting a thing, okay? You're actually changing the length of your muscle, right? If you are, um, or, or fall, or yeah, so if you're lifting a thing, basically, you're moving an object, or if you're just moving your body, okay? So if you're like communicating, or you're climbing a thing, and you're actually like doing all the full movement of the muscle, that's considered isotonic contraction. That's in contrast to isometric contraction in which the tension that you generate in your muscle is not enough to overpower the resistance of the object that you're trying to move, okay? So remember on Tuesday when I was talking about the difference between the, um, the force that it takes or the idea of a muscle contraction in terms of generating tension in the muscle when you're actually lifting a thing versus when you're just holding a thing steady in place, right? Isometric contraction is when you're just holding a thing steady in place. So you're not actually going to be creating enough tension to exceed the weight of the object that you are holding, right? It's just, it's the same, okay? So isometric as in same measurement, same length. So your muscle stays the same length even though you are generating tension, even though this is technically a muscle contraction, you're not actually moving anything. You're just creating just enough tension to balance out the resistance of whatever it is that you're holding up, okay? So isotonic contraction, you're exceeding that resistance and you're actually moving the muscle and changing its length. Isometric contraction, you are just creating just enough tension to hold the object in place. So you use isotonic contraction for full-on body movements and for lifting things, and you use isometric contraction, I might as well go in here, huh? You're using isometric contraction for just maintaining your posture, right? You're not moving, but your muscles have to be a certain amount of tense in order for you to not just like flop to the floor, right? Um, for holding objects in a fixed position, like my mug, or, and very importantly, for stabilizing joints while you are contracting other muscles, right? So just because you are contracting your arm muscle and using your bicep um, doesn't mean that the rest of the muscles of your arm, even though they're not changing length, aren't working. They need to also maintain a certain smaller amount of tension to stabilize the joint around where the movement is actually happening, okay? So isometric contractions are really important for maintaining your posture, holding something without exceeding the resistance of that object, just holding it and holding it out in space, and for stabilizing joints during movements. So even though 
we consider the um, biceps brachii as the, as the prime mover, the main muscle for this flexion action, uh, that doesn't mean that the muscles all around it aren't doing anything. They may be having isometric contractions and just maintaining enough tension to stabilize this joint while the bicep does its thing. Ashley, yes. for an example, do we, okay, so do we use um, fast twitch fibers for isotonic contraction and slow twitch fibers for isometric contraction? Not necessarily, not necessarily. So it'll be, um, it's all of this is happening all at the same time and it, there's basically an, an infinite variety or infinite, there's an infinite variety of combinations of different factors that you can use to create a particular muscle movement. So depending on like the weight of the object you're trying to lift or um, the action that you're trying to do, um, you may be using any combination of isotonic and isometric contraction. That's just the type of movement, just the type of control that you have over whatever combination of number of motor units and number of slow twitch and number of fast twitch fibers that you will be using for that particular movement that you're doing. Oh, it doesn't, so it doesn't, it doesn't like fit into a, a discrete box necessarily. Like one doesn't go with the other. It, there's basically an endless combination. Um, Got and, it. So they both go together. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to cut you off. That's fine. But really quick. So they both go together. It's just mm -hmm. depending on the amount of how much you use of slow versus how much you use of fast will depend on the type of movement itself. The type of movement, think of the type of movement as just um, as kind of a separate thing. Think of this as kind of, think of this kind of separately. So the isotonic versus isometric contraction, those are always happening um, in whatever combination. They're usually both happening um, whenever you contract a muscle or a group of muscles or basically every time you move your skeleton, you have a combination of isotonic and isometric contraction happening, right? Regardless of what that combination is, um, well, I guess it is, it is technically dependent on what that combination is, but think of it as like kind of a separate thing from um, the number of motor units and the number of slow and fast twitch fibers that you're using for that, right? So it's not necessarily that you have, that you're using slow twitch when you're doing isotonic and fast twitch when you're doing isometric, nothing like that. If you're doing, if you're, if you're lifting, if you're lifting my coffee mug, if I'm lifting my coffee mug and it's considered an isotonic contraction, right? There's still isometric contractions happening in the other surrounding muscles, right? Besides the, the bicep. So you have both isotonic and isometric mo motion happening. And whether or not I'm using, however many motor units that I'm using, it literally changes every time that I do this because as I'm doing this, I'm tiring out, you know, certain fibers, especially like the fast, whatever fast twitch fibers, right? I'm like gonna be using a certain amount of fast twitch fibers at first because I've got lots of glycogen and I'm like, you know, ready to go. Um, but after a little while of doing this, I'm gonna start using some more slow twitch fibers. I might recruit some more motor units to, to add to my strength here because I'm starting to get tired right? Because I'm a weakling and I can't lift three pounds, you know, like multiple times. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes good. That yeah, makes like, like there is, there's not like a direct like correlation. So they're all working together. But they're all working together. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Depends on all the different factors at work. Yeah. <sighs> I hope that makes sense. You know, it seems, seems a little bit complicated. It's, it's really not that bad. They're just all, they're all working in tandem in an infinite number of combinations, depending on like all the different factors of the situation at hand, um, depending on what it is exactly that you're trying to do. I would say that you may not even be able to replicate exactly the exact number of motor units, the exact number of slow versus fast twitch fibers <clears throat> for every time that you move a muscle because it depends on like how much glycogen is in your cells, you know, like how much oxygen is in your cells, um, the exact weight of what you're lifting, um, everything, it, it depends on everything. And that's what's so amazing about your muscular system is that 
your brain can accommodate all of that and it can respond because if I'm like trying to lift this, my sensory nerves are going to tell me, oh, it's in my hand. And when I pull on it, right, my muscles say, okay, well, here's, we're at an isometric situation here now. If you want to lift it, then you need to, you know, recruit some more muscles to turn it into an isotonic contraction. Okay. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, but these are just the, um, that's just five different, five different terms. The type of contraction is the type of movement. I might actually, I might actually change that. Cause I've been using that, so I've been using that term so much. Okay. Versus the actors that make that movement happen in that situation. But that again, those, that combination of those actors, almost endless. All right, so let's talk about um, how we term the different muscles during those types of, during those types of movements, any types of movements. If you're moving your skeleton, then you're going to have a muscle that is considered to be a prime mover and a muscle that is considered to be an antagonist, okay? So your prime mover is, in my mug example, again, getting tired of this, I'm sure, is going to be the muscle that is like causing the action, right? So your, my bicep is going to be the muscle that's causing this flex, this flexion action of my arm. Ooh, almost spilled coffee all over myself, right? So the biceps is the prime mover, but we also have the opposite muscles that would do the opposite movement, right? The muscles back here, your triceps, are the antagonists for flexion, and then they are the prime mover for extension, okay? All of your muscle groups, every time that your joints move, you have, a, you have at least a pair of muscles. There's always a prime mover and an antagonist because muscles only pull, right? Muscles never push. The sarcomere can only contract. When it relaxes, it's not actually generating any force there. It's just relaxing, right? Can so you give that example again? I'm sorry. Absolutely, no, I was about to. So every time that you perform an action, right? Flexion is an action. Extension is an action. For each of those actions, there is a prime mover and an antagonist, okay? For the action of flexion, the prime mover is the bicep, the antagonist is the triceps. For extension, the triceps are the prime mover and the bicep is the antagonist, okay? Because muscles only pull. So if you're doing, a, if you're doing this motion, it's this muscle that's doing the pulling, this one's relaxing. If you're doing this motion, this muscle is doing the pulling and this muscle is relaxing. There's always a pair. It's always a pair. One pulls one way and then relaxes the other way. The other one pulls one way and relaxes the other way. Pulling, relaxing. Relaxing, pulling. <laughs> Sorry. And you said the prime mover is the puller, the antagonist is the relaxer. Is the relaxer. Exactly. That's a Got really good way of putting it, actually. Okay. That, thank you. Yeah, let's do that. I like that. We will keep that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions about that? Do you want me to explain that one more time, anybody? The prime mover is the one doing the, doing the pulling during any given action, right? Actions include flexing, extending, abducting, adducting, um, the, you know, supination, pronation, um, the, um, whatever the hell this thing was, rotation, right? Rotation of your head. Um, all of those are considered actions. And for each one of those actions, there is a prime mover that's doing the pulling, and the opposite muscle, which is the antagonist, which does the pulling in the opposite direction. Okay? Okay, I'm moving on.
All right, so let's get into how we are actually going to be naming all of these uh, skeletal muscles that we are about to um, talk about. So hopefully this will help to make their sometimes weird names make a little bit more sense, okay? So the, uh, the location of the muscle is often used um, in naming that muscle. So if you've got a muscle that's associated with a particular bone or body region, you may find that word in the name of the muscle. The shape of the muscle, such as the deltoid muscle, deltoid like like delta right delta is, is like the symbol is a triangle deltoid is like a triangular shaped muscle right so you've got a triangular shaped muscle which is your deltoid your trapezius is another good example it's it's shaped like a trapezoid um so the shape of the muscle uh, might help to um inform its name the relative size of the muscle maximus versus Minimus, gluteus maximus, right? Um, a longus muscle is a long skinny muscle, okay? So it'll also help you to identify them um, if they've got these types of, if they've got these types of descriptive terms uh, regarding their size, right? Having to do with size. That'll help you to um, basically like tell the difference between like your gluteus maximus and your gluteus medius or whatever, right? The direction of the fibers or the fascicles, right? So again, remember how we've got the, did I really, did I close it all together? I guess I did. The, um, the muscle, oh, I could just do this. Duh. Go back to our textbook. Why not? Okay, here we go, look at this. So fascicle arrangement, so we talked about Remember how a muscle is, is made up of smaller bundles of fascicles, right? And then each fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells. So those fascicles along that muscle can either be all lined up parallel to each other, right? The fascicles are all pal parallel to each other here. Um, this, I mean, they're pretty much parallel, but if they're kind of like bulgy, they're considered to be fusiform. Like the, like the fuselage of a jet or something, right? It's shorter at both ends and then thicker in the middle, right? So a fusiform arrangement. You have muscles in your body where the fascicles are arranged in a circle. They're actually like a circular muscle. The muscle around your mouth and the muscles around your eyes are good examples of this. We'll talk about those. Triangular muscles like your deltoid muscle, right, which the point is down here, which attaches to the um, deltoid tuberosity, right, on your humerus, and then comes up up here like this, that triangle shape. Those fascicles are arranged along that triangle shape. Um, um, let's see, unipennate, the fascicles are arranged only on one side of the tendon. We'll see a couple of those. Um, but I don't think there's very many of them in the ones that we're actually gonna be studying. We've got bipennate, where the fascicles are arranged like coming off on either side of a tendon. So like this weird like feather shape. And multipennate, right? So you've got muscles where there's like groups of them, um, like your quadriceps, right? Your hamstrings, your biceps uh, and your triceps are multiple groups of um, muscles. And the number of them uh, will also inform its name, usually. So the number of origins, right? So your biceps and triceps are going to be, are named according to the number of origins of a particular muscle, right? So your biceps brachii has two, your triceps brachii has three, right? Your quadriceps uh, technically have four muscles. Um, yeah, so those, uh, so quad, bi, tri, those types of, um, the beginnings of those names are going to be uh, based on the number of origins or the number of muscles that are associated with that group. The locations of the attachments, right? So the point of origin and insertion, I'm not asking you to memorize those for these muscles. Remember the point of origin is the, is the part of the muscle, if we're talking about the biceps again, is the part of the muscle that is, um, stationary 
So the origin is where the muscle attaches to a bone that's stationary compared to the insertion, which is where the bicep attaches um, to the bone that's moving um, when this muscle is being used, right? So when this muscle is the prime mover, right, during flexion, then the insertion is down here um, on the lower arm to pull the lower arm up, right? So I didn't ask you to memorize every origin and insertion of every muscle, but some of them are named for their point of origin or insertion. And then lastly, they might be named for the type of action that they do. So if they have the name of flexor, or if they have the word flexor or extensor in their name, then that's like, that's the action that they're the prime mover in. That's the action that they do, okay? Okay. So here are what I, it's basically what I just showed you in your text. So it's also on the PowerPoint. Um, you've got, this is, again, this is the fascicle arrangement, right? So you can have them be parallel. They can be fusiform, unipennate, bipennate, multipennate. They can be um, convergent, which is uh, just another term for triangular, which is what your text actually calls that. Or they can be circular. They can literally be a loop, a circular loop, right? Kind of weird and crazy. Okay. So for every muscle that we're going to be talking about today and on Tuesday, um, today I think I'll talk about, today I'm gonna talk about the head and neck and torso muscles. And then on Tuesday we'll do arm and leg muscles um, so that you guys aren't getting hit with this all at once. Um, we're going to talk about them based on their uh, location, right? So head and neck and torso. And for each one, I'm going to name it, I'm going to describe it, and I'm going to talk about its action. Again, uh, if I do mention origin and insertion information, um, that's not something that you need to memorize, okay? So don't worry so much about where every muscle originates and where it inserts um, on the bones that it moves around, just know, be able to identify it, be able to like find it on a body um, and know what action it does, okay? All right. So this image right here on the PowerPoint this is uh, straight from Peggy Campos with one, except one exception. I did add the platysma there. But everything else is all from whatever Campo is teaching in her anatomy and physiology classes. These are the muscles that you need to know, OK? A lot of them will sound familiar, right? So you've got like your pectoralis muscle, right? Your, your, um, your pecs, your your deltoid, uh, your trapezius, the, um, your quadriceps, your, um, well, I guess your calf muscle, you may not know the name of it, your gastrocnemius, but a lot of them uh, will be familiar. You will have heard these before, uh, and, other, and others of them you will want to use those, um, those factors that we talked about just now uh, about the naming to kind of like tease out uh, what they are or what they do or where they're located. Uh, it's usually in the name, right? So let's start up here with the facial muscles. At the same time, I'm going to overview of the principal skeletal muscles. I'm going to be uh, going along in our e-text, which matches your textbook, ideally, sure does. So this is uh, page 377 in your physical textbook, 377 in your textbook if you're following along. The only ones that are on here that I want you to know are going to be the occipital frontalis, which is this guy right here. This is considered, so I don't know why, but for, um, for muscles, maybe because it's less confusing, not sure. But for muscles, the body of the muscle or like the main meat of the muscle is termed the belly of the muscle. I don't know why that is, but the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis, that's basically just means the, the meat of the muscle that's covering the frontal bone, okay? So the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis, that frontal belly part is important because you do have an occipital belly 
of that same muscle of the occipital frontalis. So it's called the occipital frontalis because it covers the frontal bone and the occipital bone at the back of the head. Okay, so you have a frontal belly and an occipital belly um, of that muscle. We've got the uh, the temporalis muscle. Okay, this one is uh, going to be covering the uh, temporal bone, right? Covering your temples, okay? This one is uh, helpful in like eyebrow raising kind of stuff. Um, the occipital frontalis is also important for eyebrow raising and moving your forehead around, right? Um, basically what they do in terms of an action is described on page 376. First off, that should be right up here. Maybe not, is it behind? Oh, here we go. We also have, so we also have this table in your text. So it does, uh, oops, never mind, wrong one. There is a table in your text. Let me just find it. The e text looks like it's a little bit different than the physical text. So it's actually after that image in the e text. It does show um, the actions for the different muscles. So the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis, the one that covers the frontal bone up here, is going to draw the scalp anteriorly. So it's going to contract, right? Because muscles only pull. So if that muscle, if this muscle right here pulls, if it contracts, what will it do? It's going to pull your scalp forward. So it's kind of a, more of a scowling kind of a thing going on, right? Picture this muscle contracting, that's going to pull the scalp forward anteriorly and, and result in this kind of a scowling kind of thing going on here. The temporalis, um, let's see, does it even show? Doesn't even talk about it. So don't worry about the action of the temporalis. No, not there. The masseter, okay. So the masseter is going to be your jaw muscle. It is the muscle that when it contracts, when it shortens, right, you are elevating your mandible, okay? So it's, it's a biting, it's the biting down muscle. There are, it's a completely, that's the prime mover of biting down, right? Which is elevation of this bone, remember? Which means that the antagonist is going to be a different set of muscles that depresses this bone or opens the jaw, right? The masseter only closes the jaw because it can only pull. Does that make sense? Okay. So because muscles can only pull, the masseter only has that one, that one motion as a prime mover, right? Elevating the jaw, closing the jaw. There's a different set of muscles that depresses or opens the jaw, and you do not need to know them. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yep, we're not talking about those. They are the le they are the levator, oh not the levator, the depressor labii inferiosis, inferioris, excuse me. Depressor labii inferioris on page 376 would be the one that depresses the mandible. You don't need to know it. Just know that the masseter doesn't depress the mandible, right? It can't it can't push the jawbone down. It only can pull it up, right? Because muscles can only contract. Hope I've made that clear. Maybe a little too clear, right? All right, let's get to some really interesting of uh, uh, the circular shaped muscles here. The orbicularis oculi. This one uh, has a name that um, should help you in identifying it. It's an orbicularis. So Orbi as in like an orbit, okay? So circular, a circular orbit. Orbicularis oculi, right? As in ocular, like binoculars, as in your eyeballs, as in vision, okay? So the orbicularis oculi, when it contracts, it is actually going to, make sure I say this right, yep, it's going to close the eye. Okay, so the orbicularis oculi is involved in closing the eye or winking, right? Closing or winking. Blinking or winking is the orbicularis oculi's action. Um, if you're starting to worry about the actions, this list right here, which is the last 
yep, the last slide of this PowerPoint. Um, these are the only actions that I need you to know. Okay, so just for these major muscles, know the actions. So even if I describe the actions for some of the other ones, that's just like for your information to help to make either make sense of the name of it or just because. These are the only ones that I will test you on. Okay, so that's the last slide of this PowerPoint. Moving on, the zygomaticus. Okay, hard, a little hard to see on this image. Over here it is going to be the zygomaticus major. Okay, so there is a minor and a major in the head and neck portion of your lab. It does have the minor and the major um, labeled here, but I should only have yep, the major um, available here for labeling. So the zygomaticus major is the important one. There is a zygomaticus minor that is next to it. So here's the minor, this is the major right here. Okay, so I'll only be asking you about the zygomaticus major. Okay. All right. Who's next? Actually, I have a quick question. Go for it. So all of them that are listed on that screen right there, we need to know them, but the only the ones in the next slide are the ones that we need to know the function. The action, exactly. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Exactly. No problem. The last one of the head, last muscle of the head that you need to know is the orbicularis oris. So this may look familiar. Orbicularis, right, as in orbit. This is another round muscle, but we're not talking about the orbicularis oculi, no. We are talking about the orbicularis oris, right? Oris as in like oral or having to do with the mouth, right? So the orbicularis oris is the circular muscle around the mouth and it helps you to do duck face, basically. So it helps you to purse your lips, okay? So the orbicularis oris is the lip pursing duck face muscle. And the orbicularis oculi helps you to blink or wink, right? Okay, moving down into the neck here. So the most superficial muscle of the neck is, um, I mean, it's, it's just so, uh, it's so obvious here that I figured if I left it out, it, would, it might actually lead to more questions. So I inserted it here, um, even though, it actually is not shown on these images, which is interesting to me since it is the, it's the most superficial muscle here. So it's basically the muscle that's covering everything else here. You can see really clearly how it does that in this image and even more so in this image. Look at that. So the platysma muscle is basically just a long, flat sheet, um, or a, I guess more of a wide than it is long, flat sheet of muscle that covers all of the other muscles in your neck, okay? So it's basically the one, the most superficial, the one at the surface, closest to your skin, right? I have a question. Go for it. Um, in the book, it's 377, it's also um, pointing at that uh, mandible. Yeah, so it actually does, it comes up over. So when I was okay. talking about like the muscles that do the that depress the mandible or pull mm -hmm. the jaw down, um, it's one of them. It does. I'm like, hey, I remember that the mandible. Oh, good thing. Yep. It's so in on your in that. Um, let's see. It's table. Uh, well, on page three seventy six, exhibit eleven point A. Now I'm a now I'm a lawyer apparently. Exhibit I see exhibit eleven point A. I don't know why that's a thing. But on this <laughs> table that shows the actions of the muscles, the platysma is described as, uh, let's see, depresses the mandible, but also draws the outer part of the lower lip inferiorly and posteriorly as in pouting. So like, mm -hmm. I don't know, that? That, that I mean, that looks about right. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It's not on your list, so. Okay. I action, so you, I don't think you need to know that. Um, All right, cool. Yeah, so it's just interesting. It's just really interesting to me. You go through the <laughs> muscles and like try to do the actions of them all, and then you can like feel them. You know what I mean? You can feel the muscle working, then it might help you to remember them a little bit. 
better. This guy right here that you have, he looked like one of the guys from Grey's Anatomy yesterday that I was watching. Oh, perfect. His <laughs> face, I was like, he looks like somebody I know. <laughs> his sad little face with his weird little pig nose. Um, yeah. He looks with this little guy. Yeah, That's it was pretty sad. sad. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sure. It, it always is on that show. <laughs> he had like tumors in his face and oh, it was so like this function in his face. That's why this one kind of looked like it. Yeah, he's got kind of a weird, lumpy face. <laughs> it's true. Poor guy. Poor guy. <laughs> Not to make fun of people that have tumors in their faces. No, never. Never. So, uh, moving down to the neck, the only ones that I have on here are the platysma, which is covering the outside and kind of creeps up here, right? So, it's covering all the outside. But underneath that, we have the sternohyoid muscle which is basically, it's going to be attached to the hyoid bone, which remember is the little, that weird little floating bone that breaks, you know, if you get strangled, right? So that funny little floating bone attaches to the sternohyoid muscle, and you'll never guess where the other end of it attaches. The sternum, right? Since it's the sternohyoid muscle. Here it is over here, deep right here. The sternocleidomastoid. Why is that not on this? Oh, it is. Duh. Okay. And so overlaying the sternohyoid, which goes from the hyoid bone up here underneath the chin, which is not visible from right here, but it goes, goes up there. Uh, covering that is the sternocleidomastoid. Okay. So again, attaches to the sternum, sternocleido. I'm not actually sure where that comes from but mastoid as in it inserts at the mastoid process, right? So up here by your ear, under your ear, behind your jaw, right? So you've got the sternohyoid, deep, the sternocleidomastoid, just superficial to that, going from the mastoid process to the sternum. And then over the top of that, most superficial, the platysma muscle, okay? So those are the three of the neck that you need to know. How are we doing? We had several of the face. Looks like we had approximately six muscles of the face. We've got two of the neck here. That's like the neck, like the front throat area. Um, and uh, so let me, let's look at the posterior angle of this before I move on down here, okay? So we talked about the head and neck muscles from an anterior perspective. We do have some posterior ones, but they are going to be, um, some of them are the same. You can see them from both angles. So just like we had the occipital frontalis, the frontal belly, there is an occipital frontalis, occipital belly. And that is going to, I believe it's just going to be the um, antagonist for the frontal belly. Yep, so as the frontal belly draws the scalp anteriorly, the occipital belly draws the scalp posteriorly. So you can actually, I'm not even sure how that happens. Like I can't even really feel that, but you can, if you can contract your ox, the occipital belly of your occipital frontalis muscle, you would be drawing your scalp posteriorly towards the back of your head, right? You can see your sternocleidomastoid from the back here. Do we have a nice posterior image? No, we have a nice lateral image where we can see the sternocleidomastoid right here. So again, here it is inserting around the mastoid process. It's deep to the platysma, so it does attach to the sternum down here underneath the platysma muscle. And you can see it from a lateral view. You can see it from the frontal view. And you can see it from this posterior view as well. Okay, so that's all the same muscle, the sternocleidomastoid. And then on the back here, we do see the trapezius muscle, which is really the perfect way to segue into the torso or the thorax. Specifically, right, your thorax is like your thoracic cage area. The torso is really just like your body minus your arms and legs and head. The trapezius muscle is this whole crazy big diamond-shaped thing happening 
um, all along your upper back, okay? So if you hold tension in your shoulders and you like it to get a nice massage on your upper back on your shoulder area, you've probably got knots in your trapezius muscle, okay? Let's take this opportunity to visit our dissection buddy. Hey, look, I even have the trapezius right here. So check it out. Let me zoom out so you guys, you can tell where we're at, right? So we're looking at his upper back. Let's see, let's do this right. So here's our trapezius muscle on our dissected dude. All that is between the trapezius muscle and the skin is besides these um, nerves and veins, blood vessels and stuff, is the skin. So this is the subcutaneous level of the skin, right? So we've removed the, um, the epidermis and the dermis. So here's the epidermis and the dermis. Dissect that away and you have that, um, the, um, um, damn, the uh, subcutaneous, God damn it, the subcutaneous level of the dermis, of the integument, right? It's not technically part of the skin. And then just below that, you're going to have your muscles are going to be right underneath that fat layer um, of your skin or of your integument. And the trapezius is the one that is going to be covering the back of your neck the uh, most superior portion of your shoulder and part of your upper back up here. I'm gonna dissect a little bit further to get those blood vessels out of the way, some fascia. Got a really nice clean view now of the trapezius. It is a paired muscle and they are named for their um, like trapezoid shape, right? So this is one of those muscles that's named for its shape. Like the orbicularis muscles are named for their round shape, also their fascicle arrangement, right? Um, and these guys, this, uh, or this trapezius muscle is named for its trapezoidal shape. So your trapezius muscle is going to help you to um, pull your scapulae together backwards, right? It's going to help you to pull your head back like this and pull your scapula, your scapulae uh, close together. It also has a role to play in um, elevating your shoulders, if I'm not terribly, terribly mistaken. Oh, muscles of the head. So we have moved on to the, there are lots of tables here for lots of muscles that we don't need to know. Like we've got muscles of the eyeball on 380, their actions, muscles of that move the tongue um, on 383, don't need to know that, no, don't need to know those. More muscles of the head that move the tongue and stuff. Don't need to know those. Muscles of the neck stuff is on 386. Oh, this is actually a really nice um, picture of that sternohyoid. Let's see if we can find that down here somewhere. So don't worry about the eyeball muscles. Uh, we might touch, up, touch on them a little bit when we get to the eye, um, but we're not going to be talking about them now. The temporalis is a really good view of that temporalis muscle. Uh, and then the orbicularis oris. Nothing else here that we are needed, that we need to know. More of muscles of like moving the tongue kind of muscles. Nothing else really here that we need to know. This is a really nice image of the sternohyoid where it, um, where it inserts into the hyoid bone right here. So that's the only reason why I wanted to show you this really. The sternohyoid, and then here is our sternocleidomastoid again. Right here, that big one, sternohyoid. Okay. So the sternohyoid depresses the hyoid bone. So since it's attached to that hyoid bone, which is otherwise floating, uh, its contracting motion would just pull that hyoid bone down, right? So just depress the hyoid bone. Um, I'm not sure why or when that would happen. Maybe when you swallow, um, that might be part of when that actually happens. So uh, moving down, moving on down. Okay, here's our posterior view. Don't need to know uh, any of these guys, these guys are all deep to what we've been talking about, namely the trapezius. So here's the trapezius from a lateral view. Okay, so again, we're back to talking about, hello, no, this guy, okay. 
So here he is from a lateral view. And let's see if I can finally find where there's a chart for what the trapezius does. Wow, really? Let me dig around in here real quick. Wow, there's a lot of internal stuff that we don't talk about. Oh, okay, so it's way back, trapezius. So rotating of the scapula, adducting the scapula, so elevating and pulling out the, um, no, sorry, pulling in, like I was saying, adducting, so adding back to the midline, pulling towards the midline, mm -hmm. rotating, rotate scapula upward, help to extend the head. So this would be extending the head versus flexing the head. Let's see how that, how that lines up with our guy here. Elevate, retract, and rotate the scapulae. Okay, so again, elevating, uh, retracting, I don't know, rotating, some combination of that, of the scapula, the scapulae. Okay. Let's go back to a frontal view here to talk about the pectoralis muscle. We're talking about the chest muscles. We've got the pectoralis muscle, which is covering up a lot of little muscles underneath that are associated with your rib cage. Okay, so your pectoralis muscle, your pecs, right? Of course, these ones are the ones that you get big by doing push-ups, right? So if you're doing push-ups or you've got one of the, if you're, you got one of those things or you go to a gym where you've got one of those things that does this, or if you're like pulling with resistance bands or something doing this kind of action, that is your pectoralis muscles contracting to pull your arms in forward, right? Your pectoralis muscle is going to adduct and medially rotate your, um, your whole arm, your upper arm in particular, right? So like doing like this. Kind of action and pulling the arms in, right? Adducting them to the midline, either this way or this way. You're going to be using those this pectoralis major, that large, flat, triangular-shaped muscle. Ooh. Um, that is the superficial most muscle of your chest, right? Deep to that. We do have the pectoralis minor, as well as the serratus, which are, which is actually like, um, it's serrated like a blade. I'll show you more detail of this in a second. Um, and the intercostal muscles, which are literally the muscles that are in between your ribs, okay? Which help you to breathe, right? Help you to inhale and exhale. So uh, let's go back to, First, our text, make sure we're not missing out on anything over here. Okay, so here's our pectoralis major, and it's been uh, left right here because it's the superficial most muscle of the chest, but if you dissect it away, here are the deep muscles of the chest. Um, you can see in this dissection, they don't appear to be labeled there isn't a pectoralis minor hanging out in here so let's see if we can find it over here so if i move this guy flip this guy over we've got our pectoralis major here and here right again a paired a paired set of muscles usually some people are actually born without this muscle which is kind of interesting and I'm going to dissect away. Let me there we go. I'm gonna dissect away until we get to underneath. Woo! There it went. There she went. I want this to be all in color. So this pectoralis major muscle dissects away at this level, and you can see the pectoralis minor underneath. You can see the intercostal muscles in between the ribs 
here, all here, here, and here. All you have to know is, is intercostal muscles, okay? I do have your, um, in your lab, Yeah. Thorax muscles. I do have, I think they show, yeah, internal and external intercostal muscles. You don't need to differentiate really between those. Um, when you label it, go ahead, but you will only be tested on intercostal muscles total, okay, in general, generally speaking. So 9 and 10 are the inner and the internal and external intercostal muscles, but those are just muscles that are in between the ribs, okay? They actually like connect the ribs to each other. Specifically, they connect these sections of costal cartilage, okay? So remember, your rib cage is made of bone, right? Your ribs come out from your vertebrae and wrap around anteriorly, but they are connected to the sternum via cartilage, right? So the true ribs, remember, are, are directly connected to the sternum via that cartilage, and the false ribs are connected to the true ribs, right, via um, coastal cartilage. So this, it's actually hyaline cartilage, that coastal cartilage, um, is where those intercostal muscles um, are actually attached to, okay? So in between the coastal cartilage or costal cartilage of the ribs, all right? And then finally, we can see from the anterior view here, those serratus muscles, okay? Let's see if we can see. Um, oh, look at that. From the side, you can see them even better. So again, serratus, because they are serrated, like a knife, like a serrated knife, okay? Like a serrated blade. So you can see how they're sort of like, got this sort of serrated edge here, okay? So these guys help you, I believe, in doing this, this kind of thing, this kind of dance over here. Serratus anterior abducts the scapula, rotates it upward, elevates the ribs when the scapulae are stabilized, known as the boxer's muscles because it's important in the horizontal arm movement of punching and pushing. So it helps you to do this, right? Your right hook and your left hook happen because of your serratus anterior muscles, right? Which are on either one of your sides as you do this, okay? All right. How are we doing? You still with me? You guys are awfully quiet. Yeah. Still in okay, cool. Okay, so again, you can see the pectoralis major here, um, but the serratus anterior is here. It's actually harder to see, I feel like, in this cartoon than it is like on an actual dissection. So the serratus anterior here. The, uh, um, the pectoralis minor up here. There it is here, and the intercostal muscles, the intercostals are all here, in between where, in between like the front part of the ribs, okay? So the serratus anterior is going to be the more lateral muscles, and then the intercostal muscles are going to be actually in between that, that coastal cartilage that holds your ribs to your sternum, right? Which is going to be here, 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 Etc. Okay. Let's move, let's just go ahead and move down to the abdomen. Oh, you can see your serratus anterior really well here from the, um, it's actually a superficial muscle. So you can see the serratus anterior here. Um, superficially, this little strip right here is going to be actually part of your, oh, hello, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, your latissimus dorsi, which we're going to get to in a second. So you can see some of the um, posterior muscles from an anterior angle. The serratus anterior is a superficial muscle, so you can see that from the surface. And this superficial muscle here 
is going to be your um, external oblique, okay? So uh, you have an external oblique and an internal oblique. They are oblique, termed oblique because they are diagonal to that center line, okay? So this midline of this dude is here, and the external oblique is diagonal to that midline, okay? It's not transverse and it's not parallel to it. It is diagonal. It is oblique to that midline, okay? You also have an internal oblique right here, which is going to be um, uh, oblique in the opposite direction on the other side. We'll get to that in a second. So the external oblique is here. Let's take a look at it in your lab as well. So we can see it from this. Oh, so this is all your chest muscles, uh, posterior, so your superficial muscles of the upper back. That's the um, trapezius here. We haven't gotten to any of those other ones yet. Uh, deep muscles of the back, uh, really pretty much the same thing. Here's our superior or superficial muscles of the abdomen. Okay, you can see your uh, serratus anterior muscles here, serrated like a knife, your pectoralis major, or the bottom half of it, really, right here, and this, your external oblique, right here, okay, uh, anterior superficial muscles. The, um, all the terminology on these are on what is the right-hand page. For these um, for these sets, so if you have the actual book, you can see that how these must, how these pages correspond to each other. Basically, you have superficial on one side and deep on the other for the same um, body region, right? Superficial, deep terminology. Superficial, deep terminology. So when you're printing these out for yourself if you don't have the actual book, it'll help you to put them next to each other, right? So like this page would go next to this page so that you can see the superficial muscles on the body's left side and then the deep muscles of the body's right side next to each other, right? And it'll be where the deep muscles are, where your um, actual list of terms is. So this list of terms corresponds to the abdomen, including the deep, the page for the deep muscles, and the previous page for the superficial muscles, okay? So we have the external oblique, which is number four in your lab, okay? So again, it is diagonal to the midline. We can also see the rectus abdominis, which is number three, should be... Here, yep, all of these guys. Um, seven is pointing to, this is actually the connective tissue here, I believe, that it's showing. Yeah, so you don't need to know that. Just the, the, um, ab, the rectus abdominis here. Let's see another look at that. So just beneath the uh, external oblique, you will have the rectus abdominis. So these are your actual ab muscles, right? The rectus abdominis. So these guys, oops, I'm going to be on the anterior side, naturally, right? Zoom out a little bit. Hello, anybody home? Oh, I always forget that I can't do the scroll to zoom out. Okay, so let's add a layer, see if we can see our external oblique overlaying the rectus abdominis, maybe not. Okay, so what you're seeing here and what you would have seen in the rabbit dissection is the, um, the connective tissue or like the actual like tendon um, or fascia of the external oblique. So this is actually all this white stuff right here is a, is a connective tissue. It's almost like a papery layer um, that's sort of sitting on your rectus abdominis, on top of the rectus abdominis right here. 
It is continuous with the external oblique. So this is like all one sheet kind of turning into muscle over here. This is the external oblique. Um, and then this we would have seen would have had to dissect away um, on your rabbit um, specimens. So once you dissect that away, it reveals the rectus abdominis underneath here. So basically what you're doing is you're kind of like cutting away um, that, that papery connective tissue extension that reached all the way to the midline that was part of the external oblique. So you basically have just dissected away part of the external oblique muscle to see the rectus abdominis directly underneath that. So just deep to the external oblique. And then beneath the rectus abdominis, see if we can get there. They're gonna, they're gonna like disappear real fast again and scare me. Hard. At what point, at what point do we dissect away the rectus abdominis? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Oh, we dissected away the external oblique. Okay. So, okay. So the external oblique, again, oblique to the midline, and it is technically superficial to the rectus abdominis, but we have dissected away like this, this part of it to reveal the rectus abdominis underneath. If we dissect away the external oblique, we get uh, a window into the internal oblique. So this, I don't want this to confuse you guys. I'm gonna bring back the external oblique. There it is. Notice how the fascicles are arranged in this, um, it's like going up in a medial direction, right? So the fascicles, the fibers of the muscle are like going up this way on this side, going up this way on this side. Can you, everybody can see that, I hope, okay? Compare that to one, the rectus abdominis where the, uh, the fascicles are arranged parallel to the midline, okay? And if I dissect away the external obliques, which again are arranged like this and like this, we can see the internal obliques are actually arranged the opposite diagonal direction. The external obliques are arranged kind of like this towards the midline, and the internal obliques are arranged like this towards the midline. So that's how you can tell, besides like where they are relative to each other in terms of the external oblique being external and the internal oblique being internal, you can also tell them apart by the directionality of the fascicles. So the fascicles of the internal obliques are kind of pointing down towards the midline, whereas the external obliques are pointing up towards the midline. And the rectus abdominis is again, parallel to the midline. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So you can see again on this image, the external oblique here, the rectus abdominis here, and the internal oblique is here. Whoa, is it? Let's see, let's see in the textbook. Get a better one here. Okay. Yeah, okay, the internal oblique here. And then finally, deep to the internal oblique, you have the transverse abdominis. And it's transverse because it is perpendicular to the midline. Let's see if we can find that. Let's see if they actually dissect that far to see the transverse. Uh, I'm not sure here. I don't think it does. So the transverse, I think, yeah, I think that's it down there. So even deeper to the internal obliques, you have the transverse obliques, which are, it's hard to see here, but the fascicles are running perpendicular to the, to the midline. So basically running across this way, um, but only on the sides. So these guys, are literally going to be this motion here because if they're contracting on one side or the other they're going to be pulling your body in that direction right your torso in that direction so all of these combined your external oblique 
is letting you do a certain amount of twisting or lateral um, flexion, right? Your internal oblique is letting you do basically the opposite of that. It's basically the, um, the antagonist for whatever your external oblique is doing. Your rectus abdominis, of course, is letting you flex, uh, flex your trunk, right? Like you're doing uh, sit-ups or crunches, right? That's why you exercise those muscles the way we do. And the, uh, the transverse abdominis is going to be like um, just like almost like rotation of your torso, right? It's a twisting, the twisting of your torso. Okay, how much of that is actually required of you to know? Yep, we do have them. So to flex, flex the lumbar spine, right? So you're basically like uh, bowing, right? If you're bowing, your external oblique lateral flexion of the trunk. So this sort of like side to side flexion, right? Side to side. And uh, those are the ones that you need to know. Pectoralis major doing this. We talked about the trapezius elevating, retracting the scapulae. We'll talk about the deltoid later. Let's move on down the, okay. So we did the entire anterior trunk. So let's do the posterior trunk. All right, so we talked about the trapezius. We have just beneath that, we have um, the infraspinatus, infraspinatus, right? So that's going to be, um, it's gonna be associated with the spine right? The infraspinatus is going to be associated with the spine. So it does go underneath that trapezius. Let's find out just how far. And let's move to a posterior view. Let's get our trapezius back here. Okay, so you can see the uh, infraspinatus, infraspinatus, ugh keep switching between. Okay, is these guys here, which do um, continue beneath the trapezius muscle. Let's just go down a little bit. Let's um, actually, let's leave those and let's see if we can get the trapezius. There we go. So once you remove the trapezius muscle, you can see the infraspinatus infra muscle is going to be um, reaching in towards the spine. This guy, you do not need to know. You just need to know this guy. So these are considered, this is considered a deep muscle of the torso, okay? As opposed to a superficial muscle, which the trapezius is. So here's the trapezius lying superficial. And here's the infraspinatus, if it will let me. No, come on. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, we just removed them. The trapezius, the infraspinatus. Okay. And the infraspinatus, uh, given that fascicle arrangement, right, moving in this direction, and that point of um, origin and insertion, you might expect it when it contracts to, again, pull your arms back, right? Or pull your shoulders back. So let's find out if we even need to know that. No, we don't even need to know that, so don't worry about it. Okay, the, we're gonna talk about the deltoid when we talk about the arms and legs uh, on next Tuesday. Let's talk about this ginormous monstrosity that takes up your entire lower back. It is the latissimus dorsi. Ah, oh, crap, I do have the rhomboid major there. I'm so sorry, you guys. So this guy actually is included. So the rhomboid major basically picks up where the infraspinatus, uh, uh, oh, infraspinatus, the spine of the scapula. I'm so sorry. I think I just said the spine before. The, infras, the infraspinatus muscle uh, interacts with the spine of the scapula. And you can see that actually in your lab because you actually have to identify, it asks you, I decided to go ahead and ask you to identify the, um, the ridge of the scapula here. <laughs> mm 
So that should be the spine of the scapula right here, right? So the infraspinatus muscle, which should be number 11, infraspinatus is infra as in below the spine of the scapula. So that's the spine that it's, that it's referring to. The infraspinatus is referring to below the spine of the scapula, okay? Infra below spinatus spine, okay? Okay, so the rhomboid major is this guy, and that's the guy that actually goes all the way to your um, vertebral column, your, your proper spine. And I didn't think that it was in this, that it was on here, so I deleted it from your lab. Um, so I'm not gonna test you on it, because I don't wanna, I don't wanna cause confusion. So let's just take out rhomboid major when I re-upload this PowerPoint, okay? All right, the latissimus dorsi, I really wanna talk about it. So this big muscle here covering your lower back is the latissimus dorsi. Dorsi as in dorsal, right? As in the back, the, as in your back, right? Posterior, um, dorsal posterior. So on our dissection friend over here, it's this whole big thing here on either side, okay? And you can actually see it partially from the front, not so much on this guy, I guess. Um, but from he on here, we can see a little bit of the latissimus dorsi sneaking around the front there. So uh, the latissimus dorsi is going to be, uh, I'll be very shocked if it's not on here. And it's not on here. All right, fine. Forget it then. The latissimus dorsi is going to be a muscle that also helps you to rotate your trunk, right? So it's going to be uh, in addition to um, your external obliques and your internal obliques uh, and your transverse abdominis, right? Um, also probably gonna help you to like flex your, do that or um, exaggerate that lumbar curvature of your spine, right? And finally, I think we're getting close to the end of the muscles here. We're not talking about, oh, these are your, um, those are your obliques here showing around back. So your external oblique is showing back here. Finally, around the pelvis, okay? We've got, of course, the gluteus maximus, right? Um, that is the larger of your gluteal muscles. And the gluteal, gluteus medius, is going to be a slightly smaller muscle that is just deep to the gluteus maximus, okay? So on our dissection friend here, these are, um, these should be your obliques. Yeah, your external obliques. And uh, oops, our gluteus maximus has is, is been stolen, it's gone. Oh Lord, bring it back. There it is. Okay, what else we got? What else you got? That's fine. Okay, so the gluteus maximus is here. Gluteus, ooh, where is the gluteus medius? All right, so on this guy, on this dude, you couldn't really see the gluteus medius um, sort of protruding above the gluteus maximus. The way that it is, on this drawing, which is very interesting. I'm not sure why that is. But you can see it if you dissect away the gluteus maximus, the gluteus medius is underneath. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, it's just basically covered by the gluteus maximus. Interesting, so here it is on this picture, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius. Let's see what we got here for our lab. We want a posterior view. Here's the superficial version, gluteus maximus. I would expect this to be the medius, number six. Oh, no, gluteus medius. See, it doesn't show, interesting. About 10 or 11. Okay, number nine. Is that what I just said? No, it's right here. Okay. 
So on the superficial side, we are seeing number for number six, that's going to be the iliac crest. Okay, so that's that bone marking of your ilium, right? One of the coxal bones of your pelvis. So this is your hip bone right here. This is your iliac crest. And then attached to the iliac crest, you have the gluteus maximus muscle, okay? Just deep to the gluteus maximus. Again, here is the iliac crest. This is the right side now. Is the gluteus medius. Okay, so here's the gluteus medius. Here's the gluteus maximus on the other side. You want to see them side by side. Here they are. Gluteus maximus over here on the superficial version. And he's like tapping his butt. And then the gluteus medius over here on the dissected deep version of this same um, posterior torso view. Okay. Okay. And I think that's pretty much, there isn't a whole lot else going on here. We can see the, we can see some of the muscles that we're going to talk about um, when we talk about the legs. So I'm going to save those for Tuesday. Those include the um, longissimus. Um, mm, I guess that's it, the longissimus. So we'll talk about that when we talk about the legs. We covered everything else. So we'll talk about the arm. Uh, we'll talk about the, yeah, we'll talk about the half of the shoulder that's attached to the arm. So we'll talk about the deltoid arm, forearm. We'll talk about the thigh, um, some of the stuff that goes from the pelvis to the thigh, and the legs on Tuesday but we have talked about all of these guys today. And the- Actually, question before. Oh, cool. um, so will you let, would you let us know like this weekend what people prefer like either Thursday or Friday? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, I'm gonna try, I'll send that by tonight. I'll have that out to you tonight. Okay. Uh, but I, I want you guys to, um, are you guys clear on what all the things that I'm switching between here? So I've got our, this is our PowerPoint, right? So this is what you actually need to know, right? So here's the anterior, posterior, and the actions for some of them, okay? So that's what I'm gonna test you on, is gonna be the names of being able to identify, if I point to one of these, be able to name it. Same with these, be able to name it, be able to identify it. And then for this list, know the action of it. So if you're, if I'm, if I'm pointing at this muscle, oh, I guess that's not a good example. I'm pointing at this muscle, the trapezius, and I'm asking, uh, what is the action of it? That would probably, a, probably be a multiple choice question. The action will be, uh, I'm losing my mind, trapezius to elevate, uh, retract, or rotate the scapulae. Okay. So, uh, those three pages of this PowerPoint are basically going to be what the exam is on in terms of chapter 11. Um, besides, and so this stuff that I pulled from chapter 10, right, the motor unit, the types of fibers, and then the types of movements or types of contractions, um, prime mover antagonist stuff. Oh, I guess the prime mover antagonist and muscle name stuff. Don't worry about the name stuff. That's more for you to, um, to help you to remember or recognize the names of these things. But the stuff that I pulled over from chapter 10 and the um, microscopic muscle tissue stuff, um, that and these three slides, one, two, three, are basically gonna be your exam on Thursday. So. Keep that in mind when you, um, when you fill out the poll that I'm going to try and send you guys tonight um, to decide whether or not you want that extra time for this exam um, or if you would rather we like have an, a, an extra day basically like of the semester. Otherwise we'll finish the semester like, I don't know, like a week or two early and have the final like either, we'll either bring the final up and just call it. Um, or have the final be June 9th as, as scheduled. 
yeah. So I'll put all that in the email. Um, I also wanted to show you guys, that's the PowerPoint. The other things that I've been referencing here are, this is from Wiley Plus, right? So if you basically, if you log into Wiley Plus, hopefully um, you guys are, are having more success at that um, than you have been. And you go to chapter 11, which is our muscular system, and click on any of these sections. It doesn't matter. It'll take you to our to the learning hub for that section of the chapter. The uh, the dissection is under the explore tab over here. So hit explore. We've got our real anatomy. Click on that. And I'm just using this guy, this dissection. I'm not sure even what this goes to. What is this? It's the same thing. OK, so looks like that's pretty much the same thing. The dissection, I am assuming that this, this one goes all the way down into the internal organs, and that's the difference. So uh, this dissection is in Wiley Plus under Real Anatomy. Um, which is under the explore tab of any section of your of the module for chapter 11 or for any it's really it's in any section of any chapter in, which is any module you can find the explore tab which will take you to the real anatomy so just choose the dissection and uh, or actually probably choose muscle if you're going to do a self assessment right so you can choose a number of questions that you want it to ask you, um, whether or not you want to time yourself, if you really uh, want to be intense about it. And then you can go down here and you can select all of your muscles, muscle groups. Oh, and then you can um, let, it, let it quiz you and see what one of those looks like. Oh yeah, so we haven't talked about these muscles yet, but basically it's going to isolate a muscle and then ask you to name it. So that's a really, really cool interactive quiz for you to do. Don't forget when you go onto your Wiley Plus that you also have um, various interactivities depending on what section you're in. So there might be a helpful um, helpful stuff for you there, as well as the adaptive practice and the assessments, right? So here's one, the face, the muscles of facial expression. That's cute. So yeah, here's all this stuff is in Wiley Plus. So if you haven't, get in there. And if you can't, let me know. We will get on it with somebody from Wiley Plus. We're going we're gonna to make sure that you guys have access to this for sure, because it's really cool. Um, and next semester is what we're going to be using. So get familiar with it. You know, you want to be, you want to be comfy with it. All right. So once again, we did really well for time. I will be back at 530 for a Q&A. If you have any questions about anything we covered today or Tuesday, muscular system stuff. I did have, I did start a new discussion for muscles in Kansas. So uh, check that out. I'm going to be posting um, various links and helpful stuff for you guys for that. And um, so post your questions there if you have them. And look out for my email tonight. Uh, and I will upload this video as soon as I am able. Anything else before, I, before, we, before we call it here? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Have a good night, you guys. Maybe see you at 5.30. If not, no big deal. I won't cry, probably. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm not gonna cry. I'm gonna go watch The Office now. So you can interrupt me. I've seen it a million times, but I'll be fine. Stopping the recording.